The views and opinions expressed on Around the Town are entirely those of the host, guest, and callers, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the faculty, staff, and students at Elizabeth City State University or ECSU Radio and Television Services. Welcome to another edition of Around the Town with Hez Brown. And now your host, Hezekiah Brown. Good evening. Welcome to Around Town. Stop the music and stop the violence. And obviously, that's a a kind of strange name. But we are stopping the music because this time of day, you're normally listening to music. And we want that to, to kind of parlay into stopping the violence. Because if we don't find a way to stop the violence, it certainly is not going to be as many left as should be. So our goal is to, is to, in this segment, is to talk about the problem, but still seek solutions as to how to solve the problem. And we are, we have delighted, uh, we are delighted, Mayor, uh, that you have taken time out of your busy schedule to join with Clay Mercer and me to just have a conversation regarding our city. As you know, we have a conversation here. It's not an interview. It's a conversation. So we intend to have a conversation for a period of time. We're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about things that's going on in the city. And we're going to talk about this um, mayor of Elizabeth City, Miss Betty Parker, the Honorable Betty Parker, because she's been all over the news on NBC, MSNBC, CNN, Ford Magazine, you name it, local newspaper, She's been in all these things, and she's going to tell you a little bit about it as we, as we go along. As a matter of fact, I believe this is probably the second or third time since you made history as the first African-American female to this high office. So after being in office two years, then you decided to run for re-election. You ran unopposed. Why do you think no one ran against you? <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me uh, this afternoon. Uh, and uh, there are things going on in our city uh, I'm sure everyone is aware of. So uh, when you said stop the music and stop the violence, that was very, very um, uh, good to point out uh, to our community. And uh, each time I go somewhere and I'm either on radio or on uh, the set television, I want to uh, make sure that we acknowledge the Brown family and that uh, let them know that we still support them and that we understand what they're going through. So I definitely want to acknowledge them first. Now, back to that question that you had uh, about uh, my running unopposed in the uh, past election. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure, of course, why I didn't have any opposition but I like to think it's because I was doing a good job. Hopefully, most of the citizens of Elizabeth City felt that I was doing a, a good job. Uh, if it was not uh, as adequate as they would like for it to be, maybe they say, well, let's give her another two years and let's see what she's going to do. See if she'll continue to do good work uh, and improve on what she has already done. So, I'm thinking along those lines, uh, Hezekiah, as to why I ran unopposed. In addition, uh, you also made history as the first African-American female to be elected to Pestleton County Board of Commissioners. Mayor, you in the history book (laughs) twice. Mm -hmm. Coming from where you came from, did you ever think you would make history in politics? Never. Uh, That was not on my radar. There was not an algorithm for me uh, getting into politics, because as I was growing up, uh, when I uh, did take time to look at the uh, political world, I didn't see many people who looked like me, very few people of color. And here locally, I did not see any. So I felt that uh, that was just uh, out of range for me. Uh, because I was a person of color, and I never saw people uh, running or even attempt to run when I was a youngster uh, to run for a political office locally. Uh, but, you know, things change, and uh, now we're in a different uh, era, and uh, 
I, I'm hoping that we will continue to to uh, improve as far as diversity is concerned. But you're absolutely right by asking this question uh, so that people will know that I did not prepare for this position. I, not, I did not prepare to be a politician, but uh, somehow, some way, uh, I'm in this position and uh, I, I hope that I am uh, doing a good job, a satisfactory job at least for the people of this city. You know, you know what, Mayor, you know, I've, all of my life, I guess I've been in politics. It is something that you cannot prepare for. You know, sometimes people believe that once you elected to office, they want you to step in and know everything at that point in time. But when your first term, it's an entire first term primarily is a learning process. Mm -hmm. So so I know that you have focused on the job, you've been present, and you have paid attention to what was going on. And I, I know that too. You had a, a motto I thought is kind of kind of good, and I just want you to explain it. You know, I noted that your motto is retired, inspired, and qualified. What did you mean by that powerful <laughs> statement? Well, uh, that expression came to me when uh, I knew that I was going to be running uh, for a position on the, the Pastor Tank County Commission Board. And I started thinking, uh, I will need some type of slogan. And uh, since it's the first time uh, that a woman is actually participating in, the, in campaigning, I would need something catchy. And it simply came to me out of nowhere uh, as I thought about uh, where uh, I was at that particular time uh, that I am retired. And that means uh, I, I had a career in teaching high school mathematics. And in 2005, I had retired, even though I kept working, you know, in the high schools as they needed me. But I was officially retired from the state of North Carolina. And uh, when I, I thought a little further, I said, well, uh, let's look at these people. That was 2014 when I first stepped into the political arena uh, to run for uh, the position of commissioner. Uh, I saw that uh, during that time, many women were stepping out, uh, running for offices, state representatives and, and for Congress. And it seems like that was just a high energy uh, time. Uh, for women to uh, start trying to get a seat at the table uh, so that we can bring some perspective to the uh, political world and, and to helping and to serving. And they were winning. So uh, that inspired me. I thought maybe, you know, I just might have a chance at this point. Uh, and then as far as qualified, I felt that I'm qualified because it's about serving people. And that's what I've done my entire career at service, uh, service to the young people in uh, being in the classroom and, and, and managing a classroom. Uh, I felt that uh, that would be a continuation when a position on the Pascatank County Board of Commissioners. And I saw that I would be the only woman if I won, the only woman of seven people who are serving on that commission. So uh, I was really uh, inspired, and, uh, and I felt I was qualified. Well, you had already made history on the uh, Board of Commissioners. So, so, so did you ever think about at any time that that's what you were doing? And what influenced you to run for mayor? <laughs> well, it, it actually came about, I, th I think, the same way as running for uh, being a commissioner in that uh, – uh, being the commissioner, I, I was actually approached by my former mathematics, high school mathematics teacher, Mr. Cecil Perry. And I initially told him no, because I, I, I don't know anything about being a politician. I, I kind of keep up with them. You know, I, I like to keep up with politics, what's going on. But I, I really don't know uh, anything about uh, uh, campaigning, anything about any of the other things that go along with uh, being a politician. Uh, but when I found that I, I was able to uh, win uh, the, a, a position on that board, uh, I felt good about it. I felt like I was making a difference and I was, uh, you know, sharing with the other commissioners what I thought as far as how we should do particular 
uh, instances, things that came up, uh, what we should do. And, and they listened to me. And, and that was, uh, you know, encouraging for me. So I had just gotten settled to the point that I'll be a commissioner for four years, at least four years. But then after serving three years, I had two of our community activists come to uh, approach me and say, you know, uh, what do you think about running for mayor? I said, running for mayor? I told him I was just trying to get get uh, acclimated to uh, being a commissioner. I know nothing about being a mayor. Well, uh, those two people said you can do it. Uh, you haven't. Uh, you've gotten. You have gotten the confidence of the people in the community with what you have already done uh, with uh, working as a commissioner. Uh, the uh, mayor that's in place now is retiring and this would be a good time for you to step out there. And then I I said, well, do you know what? Now there have been 35 mayors in Elizabeth city's history and not a one of them was a woman. So what makes you think that I'm going to win? Uh, And then (laughs) one said, uh, you won being a commissioner. Did you, did you see any women on the board there? So I said, well, you got a point there. So uh, I decided to uh, to go ahead and step out there and uh, 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 try for that position. Uh, I said, it's a two-year position. So uh, after two years, if for some reason I- I'm not doing a good job, they won't have to vote me out. I will not run again. Well, you, I think one of the reasons that, uh, that those two people approached you was the fact that you had won uh, by a large number. Uh, this is countywide. Yes. It wasn't just a city, but when you win countywide and you see a person who's retired, <laughs> who is qualified, <laughs> I think those two people came to you and for that particular reason. And so, so uh, you know, that's how people are sometimes selected. As I said to you before, you don't never know how to do this job until you get there. That's right. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> now, you, you, you uh, further stated that you fought age and racial barriers to become the first African-American elected to this high position. Tell the audience a little bit about what do you mean by that? Well, you know, uh, not so much age was I concerned about uh, because when I was running, I really didn't think about age. I thought about, um, you know, this is just one more uh, task that has been put in front of me and, uh, like I've always, the attitude I've always had, if if it's worth addressing, uh, then it's worth uh, putting all you have into it so that you can achieve. Uh, so I didn't think about my age, but I was, I was thinking that others would think, well, what is Miss Parker trying to run for as old as she is? <laughs> but, you know, uh, I still thought about, now, it's time for a woman to be in that position. And I said, if anyone will have a chance at it, I think I would have a pretty good chance at, uh, you know, achieving and being able to uh, be elected. I said, the people seem to uh, think that I am capable of of serving them well. Uh, That was evident when I was commissioner. And I said, they probably still have that uh, confidence in me. So I I decided that I would try it. But then I also thought about, uh, some racial barriers. There are always barriers. Uh, uh, the racial uh, barrier came to mind because as I grew up here in the rural area of Elizabeth City, I went to all segregated schools. Uh, uh, there were no black students in my classrooms right on through 12th grade. Uh, the first integration uh, with uh, white uh, young ladies and men uh, was when I uh, attended Elizabeth City State University. And I remember when I was young uh, and and growing up, uh, I didn't, I was not allowed to uh, go to the local theater. Uh, We had to go to uh, a black theater. So there was the white. Uh, I was not able to or allowed to swim in a swimming pool that was here in Elizabeth City. And there was no swimming pool that was uh, 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 allowed that uh, for blacks to swim in. And uh, 
when it did come to the point that uh, the civil rights indicated that we have to uh, have more integration and allow us to swim in the swimming pool, for example, uh, it was dug up uh, just to avoid swimming together. So I felt like that we would always be separated. And uh, a lot of times I was made to feel inferior by comments that come that came from people and, and uh you know, as I was growing up. So uh, I never really thought that we would come together uh, as a people in Elizabeth City and vote uh, uh, an African-American into a position. But it happened with uh, Mayor Foster. Uh, he was the first. And it happened with uh, Mr. McLean. Uh, so uh, they were men. But I thought now, I was thinking, there are enough women out there now that are, are thinking that it's our time. It's time for us to be at the table as well. So I feel like both black and white women, black and white men, of course, would consider voting for me. And it happened. Yes, it did happen by a large margin. You know, and now while you've been in office, uh, you've made international news. Not national, but international news. But it's in a positive way. How did you prepare to be on the big stage, and how did you do it? <laughs> uh, no preparation whatsoever. I, I just, uh, I'm just living my life, and I'm just doing what I feel uh, is the appropriate thing to do a as a politician. I believe highly in transparency. I believe highly in accountability, and that's the type of life I live, and that's the type of of uh, lessons, actually, I preach to the younger people uh, that I taught and any that I came in contact with. Uh, and, and I just felt like as long as you do that and people are always watching, it may be something about you that they want you to share with the rest of the nation, the rest of the world. And that's what I attribute it to because I had no idea that I would be uh, participating, for example, in Know Your Values by um, uh, Mika, who comes on, uh, let's say, Morning Joe. Uh, and that's the first time I was on national TV. And when I saw my picture pop up, and I said she's from Elizabeth City, Mayor Betty Parker, it uh, it, it made me feel feel very proud of my town, not of me uh, being uh, in that position, but of my town being elevated. A little is, uh, you'd always say. And I just felt like I was doing something for our community. And, and I did no, no special preparation. These things are happening. Now, for those who are believers like me, I am a uh, uh, a faith-based person. I, I believe that uh, if, if there's something out there for you, no one can stop it because our creator has already decided what he wants you to do. And he will put people in place uh, or in places that will make sure that uh, uh, whatever he wants done will get done. So uh, one of the things I assumed is that he wanted me to uh, get out nationally for some reason. I've been knowing Al Sharpton for umpteen years, all right? And uh, and I note that you was on his program last week. How did you feel about it? This is, a, a again, another national program with a national figure who all just recently came to Elizabeth City. I, I uh... I'm still awestruck a bit. Um, unfortunately, it was not under the best circumstances uh, yet. And still, uh, we were out there. Elizabeth City is out there. And I want Elizabeth City to know that um, we may have things happening here uh, that may not be something that we want to, you know, really brag about. But... Uh, we have to understand, and I understand, that we did not initiate this, uh, uh, the uh, death, of course, of Mr. Andrew Brown, Jr., which, of course, just opened up the avenues for us to uh, be out there nationally and worldwide. And so I understand that 
we are still a beautiful town uh, that we as a people are, uh, are coming together and uh, trying to make sure that uh, we get through this with as little uh, uh, problems as possible. So to go on Rev, uh, uh, Rev and Al show, <laughs> it was uh, a big thing. But you know what? I've been taking all of this in stride. You know, I just say that this is just one more step. And I said, as long as I can get on uh, wherever I can go to uh, explain our situation and uh, let people know about our town and in a positive aspect, that's what I'm going to do. So, uh, you know, it was it, it was an uh, an interesting uh, position to be in to talk to Reverend Al. Yeah. Is a book somewhere in this? Oh, well, uh, seven years ago, almost eight years ago, I had decided I wanted to write a book uh, because as I look back over my life, so many things have happened that I did not even dream would come about. But uh, I want to be able to share it with someone to let you know uh, that your circumstances do not dictate your successes. It does not dictate uh, where you're going to be later in life because uh, I come from a family that was short on finances, but we were long on love. Um, uh, we, we've, I came up through the Jim, uh, uh, Jim Crow, uh, era and, uh, I, I experienced it, the, the, uh, institutionalization of, uh, economic and educational and even social disadvantages, uh, that was cast upon, uh, the colored people in the South. So I, I now, you know, feel like that I've got so many things that I can tell and that I can point out to young people to be encouraged to just continue to have your dreams and continue to work toward being prosperous and uh, keep in mind that you always have to do service for others. That's, that will take you a very, very long way in life. And I just want to share that at some point in time, and, and I'm thinking a book would do it. I'm encouraging you to do that because I, I'm now the author of two books, and uh, I waited too long. I should have wrote these books while I was in the, in the top of my career, and I think it would have been better. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it's always good to record this because and it's not where you start. It's where you end up. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So now, you don't do, uh, since we're on national news, you know, it's, that's been a very controversial statement uh, made by one of the United States senators who happened to be African-Americans. And he's happened to be from South Carolina. And he shocked a lot of people. In, res in response to Pres President Biden's State of the Union address, he was a response to that. He stated that America is not a racist society. What would be your response to that statement? <laughs> well, um, we America uh, is a melting pot of people. Uh, we have different races throughout our nation. And uh, I have observed uh, through the years that uh, there are um, facets of people, facets I'm talking about, not uh, uh, large numbers, but there's always a group that... Uh, want to indicate that their race is better than some other race of people. And uh, when I heard him say that this is not, America is not racist, uh, I was trying to figure out and try to fix it for him, you know, that it's got to be some positive in what he's saying. And I try to figure out where his mind was. What was he thinking when he said that? Uh, but but I haven't been able to figure that out yet, uh, especially if he's coming from South Carolina, because I know he has to have had have felt some racism uh, at some point in time if he lived in the South. But uh, America in general, just to say, you know, it's racist. It's it, it actually the people uh, that 
uh, a bias of the small groups here and there that are racially biased that make things bad, you know, for us all. But as far as racism, I have felt it uh, in America. I still feel it from time to time because we still have people who have in their minds that they are superior race. And until that is eradicated, and I don't think it ever will be totally eradicated, uh, then we're going to always have problems when it comes to diversity. I think you're right. Uh, the reason I say that is because, see, when you make a blanket statement, you know, and if he had said, uh, I think there are some people who are racist in, America, in our society be good, but to make a blanket statement, mm. you know, I think that that was a great and gross error. That's from my perspective. Now, uh, you know, you are, I say, seasoned uh, enough to have lived through the Jim Crow era. What is different now? Well, now I get to go to any movie theater I want. Uh, I get to swim in the mead pool if I want. Uh, I get to go to any restaurant that I choose to go to without being harassed. I get to be with people mixed races, and I do not get uh, heckled or uh, I do not get to, uh, you know, where people make me feel inferior. That is a big change. Uh, I'm afraid, though, that uh, there may be some elements of that Jim Crow era uh, trying to sneak back in here on us when it comes to uh, the, the voting uh, changes that are trying to be made. Uh, some people may not see this, but it appears to me that uh, it, we may be going back to the point that we want to limit the the number of people in certain races uh, to the uh, their degree of voting. And uh, that concerns me because I think it, it can easily turn back to some of the old ways, because as I think back to when we had Reconstruction and uh, we were told, you know, that we were going to get uh, how many acres, 100, 100 acres and 40 a mule, acres. 40 acres, 40 acres and a mule, I believe yeah, it was, right. or something to that effect, uh, and that uh, uh, black people were getting into office, uh, political offices. It was a time where uh, we were trying to uh, get into the mainstream of things, and we were allowed to do it after slavery. But then there came a group of people who uh, started putting up uh, monuments and, and, and other indications to remind uh, the African Americans that, uh, no, 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 you're going to have to slow it down uh, because we're just not going to have it because you are not equal to us. Uh, and what happened is the Jim Crow uh, era came about when we from Reconstruction, where we were upbeat and then back to where we was still being uh, not in, uh, I guess, official slavery, but we were not allowed to have the freedoms that our counterparts had. And for that actually to come about. There have to been what we call the good people who wanted to be fair that did not speak out, did not do what they needed to do to make sure that we were not uh, again take freedom taken away from us to be able to uh, to be in politics to uh, to be able to do some of the things that we had not been allowed to do as slaves uh, because I remember Hugh Kale who uh, was a uh, uh, first president. Well, actually, he served on, he was black, and he served on the uh, Board of Commissioners, Pasquotank County Board of Commissioners. That was way back in 1891. Uh, but I was the first person, first African American to run at large and win since Mr. Hugh Kale in 1891. And that was because of what happened uh, between the time of Reconstruction and the uh, Voting Rights Bill and the Civil Rights Bill. Again, 
This is around the town. Stop the music. Stop the violence. We'll be right back after this. WRVS 89.9 is seeking volunteers to join the ECSU Vikings Sports Network. You can help us bring Mighty Vikings Athletics to the radio and gain valuable experience. Volunteer positions available include play-by-play announcer. Potential candidates must have a clear speaking voice and knowledge of college football, basketball, and or softball. Volunteers may travel to provide radio coverage of ECSU Vikings Athletics. Color commentator. Volunteers will join the play-by-play announcer in presenting the game on radio. Potential candidates will be expected it to enhance the presentation with facts and insights. Board operator. Volunteers will control the audio board inside the radio station studio to assure clear transmission of the radio program. Potential candidates must be able to work nights and weekends as needed. Reliable transportation is a must. If you are interested in any of the volunteer positions mentioned, please email your resume and cover letter to your truly Clay Mercer program director at wrvsfm at gmail.com. That's wrvsfm at gmail.com. You are now listening to Around the Town with Hez Brown. Welcome back to this special edition of Around the Town with our guest mayor, Betty J. Parker. If you was, could grade yourself, and being a teacher, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you could grade yourself uh, as mayor, what would you grade yourself and why? You know, that that's a hard question, you know, where you say grade yourself. So uh, I'm going to put it this way because, you know, I'm a person who, you know, uh, you know, the word says, you know, don't be prideful. Uh, and and I've, 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 I try very careful to follow uh, the word. And uh, so I'm going to take that where you asking me how would I grade myself as to how would I rank myself and when you say rank, uh, I'm talking about in uh, comparable to other people who are in my position or as politicians. And uh, I, I like to interject here that uh, if you talk about perseverance and you're talking about uh, commitment and uh, tenacity and, uh, you know, and serving our people, I would say that I am second to none. So that's how I would rank okay. myself. Uh, okay, tell us what your biggest disappointment is. Oh my, my biggest disappointment uh, has, has come recently, and that is what has happened uh, in the shooting death of Andrew Brown Jr. My disappointment actually begins uh, uh, with actually the citizens of Elizabeth City, and I'll tell you why. For them not to know the difference between uh, uh, the uh, Pascatank County Board of Commissioners and the Elizabeth City uh, City Council was uh, discouraging. People have uh, do not know that the Pasquotank County Sheriff's Office or department is under the jurisdiction of the Pasquotank County Commissioners. And that the Elizabeth City Police Department is under the jurisdiction of the Elizabeth City City Council. There is a difference. Uh, the city is in the county, but none of our police officers were involved in the execution of the warrant. They were not told that it was happening. Uh, and so uh, when we go nationally, the national people don't, uh, you know, really know national media. Uh, They just put Elizabeth City, Elizabeth City. But now they know the difference. That's why uh, I I, I had to go on many uh, media sites to make sure I get that out to people who do not live in the city. But there are two different law enforcement uh, agencies in our community. And there were people in our community who did not know this because they were asking me, why aren't you being more transparent? Why don't you uh, uh, tell us what happened? Uh, 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 we, we demand accountability. They were saying that to their mayor, who has not g- been given any information as to what the investigation is or what stage the vesti- investigation is, what uh, any other th- uh, uh, matters that entail what went down in that particular uh, incident. 
So that disappointed me more than anything else for my people not to know their people and our uh, our uh, obligations. And, and, and where we stand in this community, we are two different entities. The Pasquotank County Commissioners, uh, in which the Pasquotank Sheriff Department uh, operates under, and the Elizabeth City Police Department and the uh, Elizabeth City City Council, in which that department operates under. And so uh, I'm a forgiven person uh, because now I think most of the people in the community know the difference and uh, I don't have the problem that I had in the beginning. Let me ask this question then. Uh, you know, now by just simply explaining the difference, did that put any strain on the government, I mean, on the, the county and the city? Did that affect their relationship at all? Well, I, as I say, I'm always transparent and truthful because that works best for me. I have not heard from the uh, commissioners uh, from April the 21st up until this moment, uh, there has been no conversation, uh, no contact uh, from uh, the Pasquotank County Board of Commissioners. So I knew that we had a, a pretty good relationship before uh, all of the crisis arose uh, dealing with um, uh, the uh, Andrew Brown uh, shooting. Uh, we were having joint meetings and uh, periodically, not that many times times during the year, but we had started back doing that when I became mayor. So uh, to answer your question, I, I am assuming that we still have a, a cordial relationship uh, as we had prior to uh, the crisis. Okay. Thank you. Not, not turning to another matter, you know, worldwide, we have been uh, well over a year now, we've been faced with this. COVID-19 pandemic, all right? And uh, it has, a lot of folks have died, a lot of folks are sick, and a lot of business have gone under because of this. What, are we okay in Elizabeth City in regards to uh, individuals getting a vaccination? Do we have a large number of people saying, I'm not going to do it? Or are people kind of falling in line and getting vaccinations? Uh, from my perspective, my uh, point of view, uh, I think we have a, uh, a good number of people who are going out to get vac vaccinated. Actually, when we first had the opportunity to, to get the vaccination beginning in January, uh, lots of people went out to get vaccinated, uh, including myself and my husband. Uh, we, we both got vaccinated in January when it first came out. We've, and we've had both of our uh, vaccinations. So uh, I'm thinking in Elizabeth City, we have done well, in fact, in this region. And I give a lot of the credit to uh, Mr. Battle Betts, who is the director of the Albemarle Regional Health Services, because when it was known that we could get those vaccinations, he worked in concert with uh, Centera Albemarle uh, because uh, the um, vaccines would have to be in, uh, refrigerated at a certain temperature, and uh, and Centera had the uh, Albemarle Centera Albemarle had that capability, so he was able to get uh, doses into our area and uh, get the information out so that we could get vaccinated. He uh, actually, uh, and of course his uh, staff, uh, got. Uh, ahead of it got ahead of the game by making sure that they were ready to to disperse it and have the people uh, let the people know that it was available so I think we've had a pretty good handle on uh, getting people vaccinated we, as far as deaths are concerned uh, we any one death it, it is not good but uh, we have had a minimum amount of uh, deaths and uh, as far as those who've been getting sick, uh, quite a number got sick, but they recovered. So uh, we've done well uh, in this area as far as uh, vaccinations are concerned. And I'm real proud of my people who, who are coming out. Would you, would you encourage everyone to be vaccinated? We need to get vaccinated. Uh, and each time since the uh, pandemic uh, uh, reached our area and reached our country. Uh, 
when we have our regular sessions of uh, the city council at the end where uh, council members and the mayor gets uh, get to uh, give comments, I always give information out to the community about uh, the coronavirus, uh, about what to do to uh, to help mitigate the uh, circumstances. So I continue to give that information out and I continue to encourage our citizens to get vaccinated. It's very important that you do that because it's not just about you. It's about all of us in this together, because if you get vaccinated, you're protecting not only yourself, but the other people that you come in contact with. If uh, if you feel like, well, I just don't want to, to get vaccinated. I, I, I'm just against that. Well, if you think that way, uh, try thinking a, a different way in that, okay, I'll do it because it's going to help save someone else. It's going to help me from transmitting it to someone else, and and, uh, and they may uh, get very sick from it or, uh, uh, God forbid, they may pass away. So it, this pandemic is... Uh, let's say it, it's a disastrous thing. Uh, it, it's it's really taken a hold of our country, and uh, we're doing much better now. But I want the people of this community to think about India, the country of India. They were doing fine. They were doing about how the United States is doing as far as curbing the uh, uh, the the number of people who are getting infected and uh, the number of deaths. But now the tables have turned. The tables can quickly turn, uh, my people, when it comes to this virus. It is seeking whomever it can seek and devour, and, uh, and you are not exempt. And our country can go back to, uh, uh, to where we were in a, a position that uh, we have so many deaths and 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 so much so much sickness, just as India is now. I simply tell you to to to, to go on your internet or wherever and, and check out what's happening there, because it could very well happen here as well. Okay, thank you. Now we now we have found a pro- process to deal with the uh, COVID nineteen, and it's a very slow process. But if you figure we got three hundred and 30 million folks in this country, so it's going to take a while to to get to the end of getting everybody vaccinated who really wanted to, you know. But we haven't found anything yet to deal with this other epidemic in terms of the shooting of Andrew Brown Jr. Yeah. Because uh, we don't, uh, as far as I know, there's very little information been given out, no matter who came, no matter who said, very little information given out. But it has had, I just want to know what impact has it had on Elizabeth City? It has had had a tremendous impact on Elizabeth City uh, in that we did not realize, and I'll, I'll just speak for myself right now, uh, that there was such a law in place uh, that would not allow quick transparency uh, when it comes to body cam uh, video and dash cam video that uh, officers, police officers, wore. Uh, I thought within 24 to 48 hours, uh, you would be able to get the video and let's see exactly what happened. But that is not the case. Uh, The law is that a superior judge has to give the okay to release it. And so our council, the city council, uh, had an emergency meeting uh, on the 23rd uh, to draw up um, a requisition to uh, have the uh, video released to the public. And uh, we found out, uh, you know, that we would have to go through Sheriff's Department, the DA, and then Superior Court. Uh, that's all the hands that it went through. So we could make sure we get the right person. Uh, to release it. Uh, We thought it would be a long shot, but then we were told that the family could get it. Uh, That's what we were told. And uh, now, uh, then we found out that the family didn't have access to it. And then when they did get access to it, uh, it was just a 20-second snippet. So all of this is a bit of confusion 
for our um, for the people in our community uh, because we're thinking that if you release the video, it would uh, give some closure to all the speculation. Uh, and so as long as uh, people are allowed to speculate as what's going on, they lose trust in the system. So uh, they lose trust in uh, our system of policing. Uh, so we have been affected, and I've been trying to do all I can uh, to, to find out what I can so that I can share it. But I have not been giving anything, and, and I want the public to know that. Uh, but uh, if you have been keeping up with the news or with the media, uh, we see that uh, the family, or at least a member of the Brown family, would be able to see all of the video uh, I think it would be, it says within 10 days, I think it will be this Friday coming up. Uh, and, and I'm not sure about that, but when he ruled, whatever day he ruled, it was 10 days from that day. Uh, so that was a partial victory. Uh, but the judge also said within the next 30 or 45 days that the public and the media will have access to it. So then that will be a good thing. That's not guaranteed yet. But the partial victory is that the family, who should be the focal point of, of any demonstrations, any protesting, it has to be about the family first. And so that when I heard that they were going to allow the family to see it, uh, I, I felt kind of relieved uh, at that point. But I'm still looking forward to the public getting the information so that uh, there will be total disclosure of, of what happened. So this, you know, for example, you know, I thought that the, the uh, body cameras was designed for transparency. Mm -hmm. Can you, in your wildest imagination, uh, uh, just imagine what happened before the cameras, before the videos, what really happened? And, and, and there, I mean, I'm not, cut, I'm not a really down in the police department because everybody is not doing what this is. It's a, it's a small amount of people who still are doing this, you know. Some folks don't like to hear me say it's a smaller amount of people. They want to paint a bigger brush. Mm -hmm. But it's not every policeman that's involved in this kind of activity. It's just some. And then the body cameras were supposed to be able to, so you could at least see what they were doing. And they and it would might, you know, uh, kind of slow them down on doing some things that was wrong to do. Mm -hmm. But apparently that's not working because this is not transparency. When you say, well, uh, we'll show it to you. We won't show it to you at first at all. Then we can give you 20 seconds step. And then we're going to give it to you another time and in steps. But in the meanwhile, it's having a devastating impact on, on this community. Mm -hmm. Because when it is really revealed, what happens then? Well, um, I, I understand where you're coming from, and my sentiments are, 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 are practically the same. Uh, we have to understand that there are bad actors in any organization. Uh, and uh, from time to time, we do need reform. Uh, and when we started talking about reform, uh, there was one thing that uh, I was not aware of or I just, you know, I, I didn't have any reason to even uh, question uh, uh, the uh, laws that were uh, granted to policemen. And one was that immunity one, uh, that they're going to be immune uh, from where uh, they can be sued or they can be do the uh, or. Uh, be questioned on this and question. That is something that I think needs to be changed. Uh, the uh, mass uh, or the majority of any pol uh, police organization, I believe, are uh, in the, on the up and up. I believe that. But like I said earlier, there are bad actors everywhere, and we have to uh, be prepared to, to uh, make them accountable. And you know how we do it, people, now, is that we have to do it through the law. Uh, the law where we can't get immediate uh, access to the body cam of the policeman uh, who tax dollars <laughs> pay for those uh, cameras. Uh, we have to go next to protesters it, to uh, the capital uh, of Raleigh, go to Raleigh and, and uh, uh, demand that that law be changed that we have to wait and get it from uh, a superior court judge uh, or whatever is hindering us from at least getting a 24 to 48 hour access to it. 
uh, because that's when people start stewing and they already hurt behind uh, uh, a death and, and they think that there was some kind of uh, mismanagement uh, and uh, resulted in the death of a person uh, via police, uh, that causes community uh, uh, unrest. And that caused, uh, actually that caused uh, people in my position to have to really uh, get on board and and talk to the people and uh, implement whatever is necessary to keep us all safe. So I think if it was just a matter of releasing it so that we know good, bad, or indifferent as to what happened, then we would not be on pins and needles as, as some of us are. Yeah, also, this has caused something else, you know, to happen uh, in our city. Uh, uh, I know the city council and yourself had to declare a, a state of emergency. Is that still in, in effect? Yes, uh, we still have, in effect, the state of emergency. And, and I'd like for the people to know why, uh, I'll just give you some insight into why we have that. When we had this high energy swimming around uh, on the day of the death of Mr. Andrew Brown, people wanted answers. They uh, were just so upset, and it, they needed to have some type of outlet. So in the beginning, uh, the uh, police department and uh, city management uh, let the protesters go ahead and organize and uh you know, work with the police uh, chief, uh, Mr. Eddie Buffalo, and also to work with uh, Mr. Freeman, our city manager, uh, and letting them get out in the streets and, and go ahead and show how upset they, they were and the, the unrest they felt. So that was an outlet for them. But we also saw that we needed to go ahead and implement the state of emergency uh, because of unrest that we saw. Uh, even though the, protest, the, pro, uh, the protests have been primarily peaceful and, and peaceful via the people of Elizabeth City. But if it went south, if it went in, in, a, in a way that would be negative and it would be unsafe for our citizens, we wanted to have already in place the state of emergency so we can quickly access any of the agencies that we needed, any of the resources that we needed in order to help us mitigate uh, any circumstances that went out of control. So that is, I am always a person of being proactive. Uh, I'm always looking and researching and uh, uh, looking, uh, you know, trying to see what are the uh, possibilities of this happening? What are the possibilities of that happening? So how would I be able to uh, mitigate it? I, I use that word quite often, and that is to make it less severe. What do I have at my disposal? And, and when I find out what I have at my disposal and what I need to do in order to quickly access it, then I put uh, into play that which will allow me to access it. Okay. Now, Madam Mayor, we have spent a lot of time... <clears throat> Like most of the news media do, they spend time on talking about the problem. But at some point, and probably very soon, uh, this is going to be somewhat over, and it's going to leave some scars on people. I don't know if it's going to cause any racial divide. Where do we go from here? Well, you know, uh, I am not naive to the point that I... I, I think that everything is going to be just uh, fall right back to normalcy and uh, everything is just going to be so pleasant. Uh, but I am an optimist. I know the people of this town because I've lived here. I, I was uh, brought up in this town, in this area. I know that we are a resilient people. And I know we always want the best for our town, for our uh, a city. And the county. Um, so I know that once we have, uh, you know, gotten some, at least some of the transparency that we need and, and accountability on its way, that we can begin to heal. But we're going to have to work together on that. Uh, 
and uh, our past, uh, the last uh, city council meeting that we had this past Monday, uh, the city council voted to uh, have a joint meeting with the Pasquotank County Commissioners so that we can talk about uh, how uh, what we can do in order to start the healing process of this town and this county. I uh, submitted a letter to uh, the chairman of the Pasquotank County Commissioners uh, this morning uh, to Mr. Lord Griffin. Uh, that that was the pleasure of the council uh, that at, at some time and, and soon could we get together and just talk about this, uh, about the healing, not necessarily about uh, of, of investigation, any none of that, uh, but about, you know, how do we get back on track? So that we're gonna, it's going to take the organizers of, of the protests and all, because I know that they are a concerned group of people. Uh, for those who did do pro protests, we'll need you again to meet uh, so that uh, we can talk about this and uh, actually uh, reach out to those who are still, you know, uneasy about uh, what comes next. To me, what comes next after we can get over this hurdle of uh, of transparency and accountability from uh uh, the sheriff's department and from uh, the DA and from whatever other agency is going to give us uh, answers. We're going to still have to live here in this city because this is our home. So we're going to take care of that and take care of our people by uh, coming together and talking about what would be the best way of us healing and getting back on track to being the best city in, in, in the country. Uh, we, we can be a model for uh, other cities that has had this problem because this problem has, as I understand it, been going on uh, uh, for, for a number of decades. Uh, but it just happens that now uh, with all of these uh, this technology, the new technology that we have that people can uh, video you right on the spot. It is becoming evident that we need to do something. So coming together, working together with the different entities in our city and the uh, the people who ha have uh, organized the protest, then they can organize groups to talk about how we move forward as well. Madam uh, Mayor, you have really, really, we have scanned the world in this interview. <laughs> yes, we have. But I have always contended this about Elizabeth City. It is small enough and it's smart enough to become the best city, not in North Carolina, but in the nation. Yes. We have all of the tools here to make this work. Mm -hmm. You know? We have two universities and one college, yes. small town, all within the two or three mile range of each other. All we have to do is work on the foundation of it. And mm -hmm. guess what? I guarantee we can come out stronger. Okay. And could I just say one thing here? Uh, since you mentioned the uh, institutions that we have in this city, and, and actually uh, that's a good thing is that we've got, a, that's a, a, a diverse group of people right there, people from all over when you uh, think in terms of MACU and uh, ECSU. Uh, people come from all around to attend those institutions. Generally, the um, community college, College of the Album, are uh, people right in our region. But those three institutions are, are uh, you know, a plus to our city and, I, and our location. We're not far from the beaches, not far from the Hampton Road area. We are an excellent uh, uh, location uh, for people to want to come and visit and to live. And I do want to point out that uh, the city reached out to these institutions. We reached out to ECSU, uh, you know, to see if we could get, you know, help uh, and we reached out to Mac U and, and we reached out to uh, the president at COA and uh, all of them were standing ready to help us in any way that they could. That's called partnership. So we can be the best of the best 
if we work together. And I know that these three, the chancellor and the president of MACU and the president of College of the Albemarle, uh, are standing ready to, to, to forge forward uh, with uh, making this the best city that we, uh, we can be because they have indicated that to me. Uh, we have had many conversations together, and I am encouraged. So I want the people of Elizabeth City to be encouraged, and, and let's just, you know, keep moving forward. Uh, the Honorable Mayor of Elizabeth City, North Carolina, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join with Hez Brown and ECSU <laughs> 89.9 FM. So we appreciate you taking the time. It has Thank been you. my pleasure. All right. Thank you for listening to Around the Town with Hez Brown, recorded and produced at WRVS FM Studios on the campus of Elizabeth City State University. If you are interested in becoming an underwriter for this show, call 252-335-3985.